that God has given us. So, I thank God once again that I'll be a part of your studying of the book of Romans. So you have already two Fridays studying the book of Romans. And you already discuss from chapter 1 to uh, from ch chapter 1 verses 1 to 7 for the last two Fridays. And our topic for today is taken from Romans 1 verses 8 to 15. We have already seen that the Apostle Paul is the deliverer of the good news. In verse 1, Paul's bond servant of Jesus Christ, <coughs> called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. The word gospel comes from the true word, the two word, Greek word, good and news. So the good news of God. <coughs> the good news of what he did for you and I. <coughs> in me, in Jesus Christ. Paul is not only a deliverer of the good news of the gospel, but he is also a debtor of the good news. <clears throat> the last verses that you have studied, we found that the, the, the gospel is about the Lord Jesus Christ. And in the, in the verses that we have to study today, Paul is reminded us that we are a debtor of the good news. <clears throat> what do I mean, a debtor of the good news? We used to sing a song, but I cannot sing this song, just I read. <coughs> he paid a debt he did not owe. I owe a debt I could not pay. I indeed someone I needed, the, I needed someone to take my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace, all day long. <clears throat> Christ Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. That is the good news. <clears throat> that is the debt that I could never pay. God did it through His Son, Jesus Christ. Coming in coming to this earth to take our sins upon himself. That is the debt he could not pay. He paid it for us. However, once we received the goodness of Jesus Christ, we became debtors or under obligation as we read on verse 14 of our text. <clears throat> and we now owe a debt that we not only can pay in the energizing of the Holy Spirit, but we must pay. <clears throat> verses 8 to 15 are the verses we are looking at this time, at our text. So we don't need to disassociate verse 14. In verse 14, Paul saying, I am under obligation, both to the Greek and the barbarians. What? To the wise and to the foolish. The little term, I am under obligation, is the Greek word that means I am a debtor. Paul says, I owe a debt 
that I must pay. But the way it is in the present tense. No, it is in the present tense. Paul says, I am always, all times, and by conduct, and by what I do, repaying a debt that I owe. <coughs> so the gospel is about God first. It's about what he does, and especially about the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the gospel concerning Christ, and it's the gospel that radically changed us. It changes us, it changes our purpose, it changes our priorities, it changes everything. In other words, the gospel is about something that God has done for us. Not about something that we do. <clears throat> Ultimately, the gospel is about something that God has done outside for us that rescued us from the mess we have for, we have often ourselves gotten ourselves in. And so, all the praises and the glory goes to God and not for ourselves. His focus on the gospel is that it is something that totally transforms us. It makes all the difference in the world. It impacts every aspect of our lives. It changes the way we look at ourselves. It changes the way we see our purpose in life. Let's read our text from Romans chapter 1 verse 8 to 15. <clears throat> Paul says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I remember you always in my prayers, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gifts to strengthen you or to establish you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you in order <coughs> that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to the Greek and barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. Let us pray. <clears throat> Father, this is your word. May the Spirit illumine our hearts to it to its truth. It such not only to be steered by it, love it, and to be intrigued by it, or even read by it but to be changed by the renewing of our minds that we might hear and do thus and away. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So the Apostle Paul begin his letters almost uniformly with words of thanksgiving. If you were to turn to the epistles of the Ephesians, we would begin with a long praise here would begin with a long praise to God. Thanksgiving to God, which includes the things which God has done to the Ephesians. <clears throat> and we, and so we will see throughout his other letters, except one epistle, which is the Galatians. The Galatians, he opened with thank, uh, he opened with no thanks, he opened only with an amazing declaration. In all his other letters, however, 
he opens his word with words of thanksgiving. And here is a very short thanksgiving that the apostles have written us to us to us in our text. So if we see in verse 8, Paul's report of his thanksgiving to God because of the Roman Christian church's testimony. <clears throat> here Paul is going to teach us about prayer. He's going to teach us about the theology. <clears throat> Is going to teach us about the proper love that Christians ought to have for one another. And we see at the first verse, we notice that Paul begins his prayers by speaking of thanksgiving. Thankfulness is an essential Christian grace. To be a believer is to be a thankful. <clears throat> Because to be a believer is a recipient of God's mercy. For those who have received mercy and forgiveness and grace are inherently thankful. Are we thankful? My brother, my brethren. It doesn't matter what circumstances they we find in ourselves. They may they we may we find facing health problems, may we find ourselves very difficult situation or a family situation, may we find ourselves in the situation at work that could cause anybody to pull our hair out, but we must be thankful because we know that no matter what we face, we have never gotten that we, but that we deserve. The Lord has always given us better than we deserve. And they inherently thankful people because they know that what they are and they know what they deserve. And they know what God has given them instead of they cannot help but be thankful. This believers. It doesn't mean that they don't go through times uh, to times of struggle, of doubt, and even spiritual depression. But fundamentally, the thanksgiving, they never deserted them. They are thankful people. They are grateful people because they are people who fundamentally are people who are recipient of grace. And the Apostle Paul, in the midst of all his own challenges, in the midst of his own vocation, his labor, his struggles, is a thankful man. He cannot begin to his prayer without beginning with thanksgiving. And uh, this reminds us of the missing component to so much of our prayer. Why it is that we fail to see sometimes the things that God is doing, doing in us and for us. But sometimes our prayer is only rotating to ourselves. To me, for me, God give me, give me, give me, I'm Jimmy. All sometimes our prayer is, is rotating only in our lives. But here goes his prayer is for the Romans believers. <clears throat> because we fail to thank him for it and therefore we are not reminded of even in the process of our praying. And Paul begins with thanksgiving. <clears throat> We see a lack of thankfulness is a sign of gracelessness because those who are forgiven much, not only forgiven much, but they thank much for, the, for, for that forgiveness 
even as Jesus said in the gospel. And so Paul's begin by thanksgiving and that is the lesson that is a lesson to us. That's the first thing we see in this first verse of Romans chapter 8. The second thing Paul notice Paul thanks God for the Romans faith. He says, I thank God for your faith. Why? Why Paul thank God for their faith? Because God is the cause and the root and the source of their faith. Even their faith is a gift of God. Salvation is of sovereign grace. And even the faith and repentance which we manifest in response to the gospel message itself our work of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> in us, Paul thank God for their faith. And that is the proof that faith is a gift of God. It's not just the salvation in general is by grace. It's even that faith is a grace. And so, Paul says that truth and their believing and their trusting in God himself, that's the second thing we see in this, in this verse 8 of our text. Then we notice the third thing. Paul, in his thanksgiving, is actually reflecting his love for this Christian in romance. He is praying for them because he loves them. A few years before Paul was writing these letters, these words, he was singularly devoted to extinguish Christianity and reading the word of Christianity. <clears throat> This was the things he hated more than anything else on the earth that was the Christian. When you, uh, when you read the book of Acts, you see how Paul is uh, pursuing the Christians. <clears throat> and now the same man, a different man, and now as we says, he is posing to thank God for Christians. Before he hated the Christians. But now he thanked God for Christians. And he ought to cause us to pose right now and thank God for his work in Paul. <clears throat> that is the man would now would be thankful God for Christians. He once hated Christians and did his best to extinguish them. And now he can get out of prayer without saying thanksgiving for these Christians. <clears throat> he regularly thank God for you in my prayers, Paul says. What a change of heart God has accomplished in Paul. That is the hallmark of every believer. And that is the hallmark we should have. Even as we said in preparation for the service, the special love to Christian is a part of our preparation to the Lord's table. And Paul here expresses his own special love to the Roman Christian. Here, he's never met his people. He's never met them. He's wanted to meet them, but he's never met them. And yet, he still has love to them. And that's the signal for us to pose and ask, do we have the kind of love for one another? Do we have the kind of love for one another as Paul has? Does this manifest itself in our fellowship no matter what our differences are, no matter, our, no matter what our background distinctions are, no matter what our cultures, barriers, and boundaries are, our ages differences, and all the other things that separate us and make us different, do we have an overarching and abiding real love to one another? 
I don't just mean the sentimental love that we sort of like one another or that we can tolerate one another, but a real love which desire to share life, the good times and bad times, to care about one another because we are Christians. You know, it's true that blood is thicker than water. Is it? But thank God, we went on to say, thank God the spirit is thicker than blood. <clears throat> That's a profound Pauline sentiment. He says, yes, it may be true that relationship, that relationship is a, a <clears throat> is thicker than some kind of relationship. But the blood which the Spirit brings is thicker even than blood. And uh, that is why we can say in the truth with the writers of Proverbs that there is a friend who stick, stick closer than a brother <clears throat> because of the bond of the Spirit. Now, do we sense that kind of bond among ourselves? Do we sense of the kind of bond among ourselves? Are we growing in that kind of love to one another? The Apostle Paul, this giant of truth, is not without that relationship, con relational concern. He is not without a real and tangible love for the brethren and so he provides us an exhortation even in this which he report that he prays for them. And fourth, we see in our verse that Paul is conscious in offering his thanksgiving to God through Jesus Christ. Notice his words in our text. I thank God through Jesus Christ, Paul prays confidently to the one who is now his heavenly father. But because God is Paul's heavenly father, through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, he also lived not just his, inter his intercession, but this thanksgiving to the heavenly father at the throne of grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there is a theological mouthful in this little phrase. Through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's speaking of the mediatorial work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, I lift up this prayer of thanksgiving to you in conscious dependence of the one who is at the right hand of the Father. So as the Father hears this prayer of thanksgiving, <clears throat> through the lips of his son. It has, if God hear, hearing the intercession of his son, when it lifts up an intercession, when Paul is saying here, it's as if Paul is hearing the thanksgiving of his own son as I lift up this thanksgiving through the Lord Jesus Christ. Do we realize that when we pray, as Jesus commanded us to pray, with a desire for the kingdom of God and in the submission to the will of God, our prayers visit God the Father on the throne of grace as if they came to the lips of our Lord Jesus Christ? Because every prayer that goes to the place that from God's people goes to the one who reigns at the right hand and whoever lives to intercede for us. And the Apostle Paul, in the midst of this little prayer, reports us, I thank God through Jesus Christ. That's the Paul prayers to the Romans believers. <clears throat> Then Paul, in this little phrase, tells us specifically what he's thankful for. 
And that's the next lesson we see in our text. Paul here says, here he is thankful for their faith. And for the fact that their faith is proclaimed throughout the earth. You know that you're thankful to tell you a lot about you. No? Somebody thank you for what you have done. Among other things, somebody is thank, thank God for what you are uh, done to the believers. You know? Let's look how Paul is excited here. Paul is excited about the fact that these people are believing. They are believing in the gospel of the Lord Jesus. They are believers hundred around the world, believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that their faith is so clear that a testimony is being set out not only in Rome, but throughout the known world. Not only in Rome, but throughout the known world. And it's thrills Paul, not just because of the influence this church can have or claim throughout the world, but it thrills Paul because their faith encourage him. Are we encouraged to the faith of our brethren? <clears throat> When we look around us and we think of the things that encourage us about our brothers and sisters in Christ in the local body, the church, is their faith one of the things that comes to mind that we thank God for? It rebukes us that Paul thankful to the faith of the Romans. And has never even met them. But Paul thanks God for their faith. <clears throat> He's heard about them. And is already excited about it. Are we excited about the sign of our brothers and sisters here who are growing and their thirst and hunger for the word? They are growing and they're thirsting of and hungering for righteousness. They are growing and they're hungering to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. They are growing and they're hungering for grace. Is that makes us excited for them? It's excited the Apostle Paul, aren't we? And that shows us joy and thanksgiving tells us a lot about what we care about and a lot about what we are. Our prayers ought to be shut through the thanksgiving that they ought to be shut through the thanksgiving and rejoicing over the truth and the truth in accomplishing in the heart and of the of the believers of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> then Paul says in verse 9 and 10, Paul's report of his faithful intercession to the believers in Romans, to the believers of Roman church. Paul with the divine oath testified and his constant intercession for the Romans. Paul says, God knows that I pray for you incessantly. I pray for you ceasingly. Continually. I am constantly interceding for you, Paul says. But for actually, it takes an oath here. Paul says, God is my witness. I pray you, I pray for you constantly. He says, God is my witness of how I consistently interceding for you. Why would it be significant for Paul to take an oath for these circumstances? Because he had never been to these people. And the Roman people had never been with him. 
they would have no way to knowing experientially firsthand that every time he prayed, he prayed for them. Are we praying for our brothers and sisters like Paul? And so Paul says, you wouldn't know this from, from being with me because I haven't been with one another. But God knows. God is my witness from heaven that every time I get down in my prayer, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you constantly. He sees it. God seen it. He can bear witness to the truth that what I am saying, Paul says, God is my witness how incessantly I pray for you. And he says, the same God who can witness that I am thankful in praying for you, this is the God that I serve from my heart. The God that I serve from my heart. Paul is indicating the nature of his service here. I serve my God in my spirit from the inner man, from the depth of my being. My service of God is not superficial. It's not external. I am not serving God to try to get people to think I am in my spirit, I serve him. I serve in the gospel of his son, the gospel concerning the goodness about the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is showing us here a love for a group of people that he's never met. Sometimes we met this group of people, but we don't have love. But Paul, he never met these people. He never, he never met this Romans believer. But his love is with them. He is praying for them. So every time he prays, he prays for these believers. <clears throat> you know the start of just loving one another naturally in the body of Christ, in its local expression. Sometimes there are some obstacles to get over, but the Apostle Paul is genuinely, genuinely loving of these believers. Our prayers ought to reflect our love to the church, and our service to the Lord ought to be from the heart. Our love must be from the heart. And sometimes I say, the heart of worship is worship from the heart. <clears throat> and Paul, with the divine oath, testify on how constantly he, enter he intercedes for this brethren. And he intercedes to them because he loves them. What is an attitude he has? Do we have that kind of attitude? Then in verse 10, again, we'll see that Paul prays according to the Lord's principles and the Lord's prayer. <clears throat> Thy will be done. Paul prays according to the principles, the, to that principles here. Notice his words. Always in my prayer making requests, if perhaps now at last, by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. Paul is supporting here his desire to come to the Romans Christians and to be with the Romans Christians. But he does so in explicit submission to the will of God. Paul makes it clear that he longs to be with the Romans Christian and he prays that God will bring him to the Roman Christians but he is entirely submissive to the will of God he wants to get there 
by the will of God. <clears throat> then Paul has no idea when he's, when he's writing this word, he has no idea how it's going to be that he's going to get to Rome. Paul has no idea of how he's getting to Rome. You remember how he got to Rome finally? Do you? Do you? How he get to Rome? At the end of his life as a prisoner in chain. And he and as an imperial prisoner preparing if he lost his trial for execution. That is how Paul would get to Rome. And he was delighted. He was delighted because God has long before given his burden of heart to be with those Roman Christians. And he was entirely submissive to the will of God. Are we submissive to the will of God as Paul is? <clears throat> and I wanted to say that here Paul gives us a model. Here for submitting to the providence of God in life and in prayer. No matter what. There are many of us in very difficult situations today, maybe. Maybe our personal health situation, or maybe our family member. It may be bereaved, it may be a job, it may be a tremendous difficulties in our family life or in our marriage <coughs> with our children. In that kind of circumstances, it's very difficult to believe in both the goodness and the providence of God. And I can imagine with difficult, with the Apostle Paul that he thought might have plus across his mind at some point, Lord, I've been waiting all my life to get to Rome. And here, I am in chain. What is the world are you doing? Maybe Paul's plus in his mind the words like this. You know, there's a temptation to spend so much time of asking. But in these words, what are you doing? Lord, I want to be in Rome. But I want to be in Rome by your will. What a model he gives for us. <clears throat> Even in his little prayer report of how the gospel changes a man, do we see a change man here? <clears throat> this man was a Christian killer. Paul was a Christian killer. And in these three little verses, we see the heart of a person that the Holy Spirit has laid hold of. Not just an apostle, but a Christian, just like you and me. This is Paul. And Paul desires to establish the charge by means of his spiritual gifts. When you look at our text in verse 11, we see Paul explain his desire to come to Rome. He says, I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gifts to you that you may be strengthened, that you may be established. And Paul here just tells a black point. No? My desires, brothers and sisters in Rome, <clears throat> my desires for coming to you is a desire to strengthen the church. It's a desire to establish the church by means of what? By means of the spiritual gifts. And so Paul tells us the world just in that little sentence. First, he tells us to come to serve the Romans. 
he want to come to the church of Romans not to exploit them <clears throat> he's not there to get something out of them he is there to give something <clears throat> Paul desires is to minister Paul desires is to serve he wants to earn if he wants to impart something to them when we look at the charts we see it's not a source for his our for his our own gratification or for his our own enrichment <coughs> Paul sees an opportunity to minister when he looked at the church oftentimes we look at the church as a resource for us it provides this it provides that it provides others <clears throat> but Paul doesn't look the local church like that way he looks at the church and he says hmm there's an opportunity to serve there's an opportunity for me to minister for me to give, not to get, but to give. I want to impart some spiritual gifts that will establish you, that will strengthen you. Paul tells them specifically, my purpose for ministering, my purpose for serving, my purpose for, for preaching is so that you may be established or so that you may be <coughs> strengthened in your faith. In order to them to establish in their faith, he preaches the gospel. <coughs> it's that's, isn't that interesting? Paul preaches the gospel for these Romans believers to establish or strengthen in their faith. <coughs> Paul says for them to be established in the faith, you know what they need to hear? They need to hear the gospel. <clears throat> the gospel is something that is actually to be infused throughout our Christian experience. The gospel is with the gospel is something that is actually to be infused throughout our Christian experience. We depend in our understanding of the gospel. And as we deepen in our understanding and trust and grow of the gospel, and it's, it's deepen our faith and trust in God. And as we grow and trust in understanding the gospel, so we also grow in trust of God. And so Paul says, the way to establish your faith, Romans, is for me to preach the gospel. Paul desires to be with them in order that they will be strengthened, in order that they will be established in their faith. <clears throat> Notice, notice what Paul says here in this verse. That I may impart some spiritual gifts to you that you may be strengthened, that you may be established. The strengthening of believers in the faith is the work of the Holy Spirit. By the means of the Holy Spirit. No human being has the power to strengthen or establish you in the faith. Just like no human being has the power to convert you. <clears throat> Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And by the way, doesn't that show how God's sovereignty and man's responsibility goes together so beautifully and naturally in the thinking of the Apostle Paul. Paul knows 
that he can convert people. Paul knows that he can even build them up in their faith. Paul knows that it takes spiritual gifts to do that. And yet Paul says, I'm eager to come to do this. Now that's strange. The Spirit is the one who, through his gifting, establishes us in the faith. And yet Paul says, I'm eager to be with you in order that you might be established or that you might be strengthened. So what Paul is thinking? Paul knows that the ultimate source of the spiritual growth and spiritual life is the work of the Holy Spirit. But he knows, he also knows that faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the Word of God. <clears throat> so it is the ministry of the Word of God which is the instrument that the Holy Spirit uses in the heart of His people. And Paul sees no contradiction between those things at all. And so often people who are unfamiliar with Calvin or with Calvinists think, well, you, you know, you Calvinists, you, know, you believe in God's sovereignty. And that means that you kind to sit on your hands and let sinners take care of themselves. That means if God chooses them, they come to Christ on their own. There's no need for you to get involved. <clears throat> but that's not apparent. Paul says, it's the spirit that brings growth. And that's why I am so anxious to be in your midst ministering the word. Because Paul knows that the word is the spirit or thing choice for how he, he grows people in the faith. It's the spirit job to cause them to respond. It's the spirit job to cause them to grow. But it's our responsibility, frankly our privilege, to share the word and truth. To be amongst one another encouraging one another in the faith. It is our responsibility, it's our privilege to share the word of God. That's what Paul is eager to come to the Romans, to the Church of Romans, to preach the gospel that we see in verse 15 of our text. <clears throat> And the Spirit will use that faithfulness, and so we see the coherence of God's sovereignty and man's responsibility even in the way Paul talks to the Romans in this little verse. And we see, by the way, the purpose of the spiritual gifts is to establish faith. Whatever gifts, by the way, that Paul is talking about here, and he doesn't tell us whether he's thinking about supernatural spiritual gifts or extraordinary spiritual gifts or unordinary spiritual gifts. He says it's some spiritual gifts that he wants to impart. Whatever that gifts is or whatever that gifts are, those are, the apostle sees, the apostle foresees that the function of the spiritual gifts is to do what? To establish faith. So the gift of the spirit are for the purpose of the fruit of the spirit. The gift of the spirit are the purpose for the fruit of the spirit. The whole purpose of the function of the spiritual gifts is to produce spiritual fruit that's the goal not drawing attention to ourselves not manifesting signs and wonders for others for other sakes 
but in order to those who are in Christ will grow in faith. And I wanted to ask, do you have the same kind of attitude to the church that the Apostle Paul had? When Paul looked at the church, he has the desire to minister. He has a desire to edify. He has the desire to see brothers and sisters rooted and grounded in the faith and build up. Do we have that same desire to minister to one another as Paul has? Paul's very words of description to the Roman church as to why he wants to come to them are actually an exhortation to us aren't they? We ought to have that kind of attitude about one another. We ought to want to see that one another built up in the faith. Do we have that kind of attitude? Do we want to see our brothers and sisters built up in the faith? Do we, can, do we have the mind of Paul which is really the mind of Christ because it was Jesus Christ who said I came not to be served but to serve and Paul is manifesting exactly the same attitude here. he wanted to be with the Romans not to get out from them but to serve to give something to them to serve them, to minister to them. <clears throat> and look at the next verse, Paul goes on to say, that it was, I may be encouraged together to you among while, while I'm among you. Paul here is humbly acknowledging that if he goes to the Roman church with a desire to bless them, with a desire to build them up, with a desire to encourage them, with a desire to establish them. The strange and the true reality of it is that he will be built up, he will be blessed, he will be encouraged by these believers. <coughs> Paul is not just saying something nice so that the Romans will listen to him. Paul really means that what he says. Paul is reminding us here that mutual encouragement always flow from selfless service in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Like Paul, you and I need encouragement to one another. Are we the kind like Paul that are willing to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ for us to be encouraged and for them to be encouraged from us. The irony of Christian service is what when we die to yourself, you find life. When you give yourself away, you find yourself. When you put yourself last, you find yourself first. It's the irony, it's the dynamic of Christian service. When you devoted yourself to serving others, you always receive more than you could ever give. And so I want to say that Christian approach the church and feel that the church is ministering, is not ministering to them as it ought. You know the answer is not for the church to do more for you or for me. The answer is for us to determine that we are going to give ourselves away. We are going to serve. We are going to minister, to develop a strategy, an agenda, a mindset to minister, to give ourselves away. A lot of times new church members, especially new church members among into the church, I can feel I'm lost, they, they talk. I'm overlooked. People don't see me. No? <clears throat> when some people uh, came to church for the first time, they think like that. If some people, they uh, 
recognize them, they told that people, they don't see me. And they get frustrated. I know no better way to find a place than to give ourselves away. As we minister, as we minister in, the con in the context of the local church, we will find that more will give back than we give. And that's the reality that actual impact every area of our Christian life, every relationship. God will give back to us more than we are personally capable of giving if we will devote ourselves to giving. We will devote ourselves away for someone else. Paul says to the Romans, I know that I have something to give you. But you need to understand that there are, there are things that you are going to give back to me, that I am going to be blessed by. I know that the mutual encouragement that you're going to give to me is something that I couldn't get everywhere else in this world. Haven't you been in experiences or situation where there has been someone and they don't know what you're go uh, what we're going through, but they begin to share the story about how God helps them in a very difficult time. And suddenly you think, Lord, you sent that just for me. <coughs> you sent that brother and sister who had gone through that just for me to encourage me. Are you experienced that? kind of situation. And there is someone who went to it and you brought them to it and you blessed them in a way. Or maybe in some time someone's self-sacrificial service of you and suddenly you feel like why are they giving me so much attention? I don't deserve I don't deserve that kind of attention. And yet, they're giving me that kind of attention. And when you set out to bless, you always find there's mutual encouragement in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Calvin's once said, there is no one so void of gifts in the church of Jesus Christ who cannot who cannot in some measures contribute to our spiritual progress. There is no one so void of, his, of gifts in the church of Jesus Christ. Who cannot in some measures contribute to our spiritual progress. And here the apostle quotes maybe the greatest mind and the greatest preachers, preachers ever in the Christian church is saying to these Romans Christians, let me tell you, I, as I come to give you, one of the things that's going to happen is I am going to bless by you and our faith is going to strengthen together as we fellowship together. Do we have that mind as Paul's have? And then in verse 13, in verse 13, you know, we see is the reason the why Paul's hinder to come to the Romans. Paul says, I've been wanting to come. I've been praying to come for you. Or for you, he said to the Romans. And Paul says in verse 13, the reason that I haven't come is not because I haven't wanted to. It's not because 
I haven't planned to. And later on, he's going to tell us it's not even because I haven't tried. It's because I've been providentially in there. It was not God, what God had planned. I have been stopped at every turn as I have desired to be with you. I've been prevented so far, he says. And Paul is passing just in explaining why he hasn't gotten there. He tells us something of great value in this verse, in verse 13. He says, his aim in coming to Rome was put for the Gentiles. He want harvest. <coughs> he want fruit from the Gentiles. Paul is aiming for fruit among the Gentiles. Look at verse 11 and 15. Paul says in verse 11, he talks about establishing them or strengthening them in their faith. And in verse 12, he says about encourage, encouraging them and being mutually encouraged with them in the faith. And then he, he begins, he said in this verse 13, to talk about fruit. I'm looking for fruit among you. All of these are synonyms of for what Paul's goals are. Paul wants to see people convert to Christ and he wants to see Christians built up. In other words, his aim is evangelism and edification. He knows that Christian disciples sieve and tales both. It means bringing those into fellowship with Christ that aren't in fellowship now. And as they are brought into fellowship with Christ, making them disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. You cannot be a follower of Christ and not be a disciple of Jesus Christ. You cannot be saved by Jesus Christ and you are not the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. No. Paul says, I want to have fruits among you, just like among the other Gentiles. Because Paul especially had a mission to the Gentiles. We're going to see the Gentiles nature of the church in a very next sentence as well in the next verses that we have to read. We're going to see what Paul is telling, but Paul says, I want to see the fruit among you. The fruit among you is the goals of, of Paul's to these Christian believers in Rome. As we prepare to come into church in the Lord's day, I usually says today is the Lord's day. Not your day, not my day, but the Lord's day. It's not a holiday or it is a holy day. It's the Lord's day. So every time we come to the Lord's day, as we prepare to fellowship with other Christians who are part of this church, it is a conscious thought in our mind. It is somewhere in our priority or in our agenda that we desire to see fruits among our brethren. Is that one of the things we think, we know, one of the things as we go to the church <clears throat> is not just to get something out of the sermon, <clears throat> or that we want to fellowship with our friends or our brethren, but I'm going to the church today with an agenda to bless, to encourage, to bless and to encourage my brethren, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Is this our agenda in coming to the church <clears throat> that's one of the things in our heart for one another 
we are desirous to encouraging and establish and seeing fruit produce in the lives of one another, determining to bless one another. Paul says, when I think about you Roman Christians, I want to see fruit. That's the way we ought to think what how Paul's ought to think. We ought to think how can we encourage the brothers. We ought to think how can we encourage and how this brother produce fruit in his work, in his family. How we can encourage these brothers and sisters to produce fruit. Paul was looking to see fruit produced among these believers. Are we the same as Paul's desire? He desires to see the Romans believers to have the fruit. And in verse 14, Paul stresses here in verse 14 we get our title of our message today. Paul says he stress his obligation. In verse 14, Paul says something that seems really strange. He says, I am under obligation, both to the Greek and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Now Paul doesn't even pose and qualify that by saying, I am under obligation to the Greek and barbarians who are Christians. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, he just say a blanket statement. I am under obligation to the Greek and to the barbarians, but to the wise and foolish. In this short verse, the Apostle Paul is saying, I am under obligation to everybody. <clears throat> but he says is, it's a really gentle kind of way. I mean, if he was speaking to a predominantly Jewish Christian congregation, he would have said, I am under obligations to the good Jewish people. That's not what Paul says here in verse 14. He is speaking predominantly to the Gentiles group. And so he says, I am under obligation to both Greek, the culture, and to the non-Greek, the barbarians, the one who can speak Greek right, and he says, I am under obligation <coughs> to the Greek and to the non-Greek, both to the wise and to the Buddhist, to the culture and to the uncultured. I am under obligation to everyone. That's Paul says. What had they given to Paul? Why is he a debtor to them? What had they given to Paul? What have they given to him that he now owes something back to them? Well, we have just slightly misunderstood because Paul is not saying that the Greeks and the non-Greeks had given him something and therefore he is a debtor to them. I owe them something. He's saying something a little different here. He's saying, I am a debtor. I am under obligation to everyone, all the Greeks and the non-Greeks, all the Gentiles. I am under obligation to them because of my obligation to God. God did something for me. God did something in me. God commanded something to me. That's why I am obligation to everyone because of my obligation to God. God did something for me. He sent his son to die in my place. And now my heart is 
his son's heart. He redeems me from my sins. God did something in me. He united me in his son so that now my heart is his son's heart. I want to think the way his sons think. I want to live the way his sons live. I want to do things his sons wanted to do. And what his and what did his sons want to do? The will of the Father. And what is the will of the Father? That all the nations will come to worship his sons. And so now I have the heart of his son. I want to see the nation worshiping Jesus Christ. And furthermore, Jesus has told me, go to all the nations. In fact, he came and met me, Paul says, on the road of Damascus. He said, Paul, don't kill Christians. Make them. That's why Paul is under obligation to one another. And so the Apostle Paul is saying, I am under obligation. I am under <coughs> obligation to everyone. I want you to notice that Paul is not discouraged by that obligation at all. He is not discouraged by that obligation. Paul feels no burden about that obligation. Paul isn't grudging about that. This is the most exciting thing that Paul could ever, ever think of what God has given him obligation, an obligation to share the gospel because Paul was a Christian killer. Paul had been murdering Christian, or at least aiding and abetting their murder. He had been doing his best to stomp out the church, and now God says, Paul, here's your new obligation. Once upon a time, you hated Christians. Now you're going to love Christians. Once upon a time, you extinguished the church, and now you ex you ex you're going to expand it. <coughs> Once upon a time, you were enemy of Christ, God says to Paul. And now, you are going to become his disciples. And you know what? Paul was overwhelmed. What God will give a sinner like him, that kind of an obligation. Paul delighted in that obligation because of his union with Christ, because of Christ's atoning death, because of Christ's great commission, he is now obligated to go to take the gospel to the Greek and to the non Greeks. Why in the world would he be a debtor to these people? You see, once we have received that the goodness of God. We are under oblig moral obligation to share that good news with others. Yeah. <clears throat> a lot of people can see this. Yes, I am a debtor of God, but I am a debtor to my fellow man. Not just to speak it to him, but to leave it before him, the message of God's grace. If you and I were in a ship, and the ship is about to, it, to sink, you know? and in some reason, I know where the, the, the way to escape. I know where the lifeboats were, and I know where the life jackets were. I know where the escape huts was, and I did not tell you about it then, I would not only be immoral, I would be immoral. I am under responsibility to tell you if I know something that is good. When a person receives receive the goodness of God, he is under a moral obligation 
to his fellow man, to share and to bring the good news to his fellow man. We are under obligation to our fellow man. If we don't sense that obligation, for some reasons, you sense that the world owes you rather than you owing them, it is obvious one of the things has happened. One thing, we don't understand the grace of God and we don't understand our salvation and we have a low view of salvation. And the second thing, we have never known the goodness of Jesus Christ because once we have received it and been transformed by it, we are now morally obligated to share it with fellow men. Paul's way of doing that and our way will be different. Paul's way is in verse 15. And in verse 15, Paul says, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. What is a debtor? A debtor is a person who understands the good news the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ and has been transformed by it and now feels a responsibility to somehow get that news to someone else. It is something that is deep down inside our heart. We can make ourselves a debtor. God has to make us a debtor. When we see that the good news is what the good news is, we can't help but tell it to other people in some way. It might not be in the pulpit like this. It may be by the way you give. But we become a part of, the, of God seeking a lost world with His good news. We feel an obligation and responsibility to our fellow men. And that Paul says in verse 15, I am eager to preach the gospel. He's showing his strong desire to edify, to seek converts in Rome. Is that the kind of spirit that we have about our service to one another? Are we eager to edify one another? Are we eager to see people brought to Christ? Church, it's one of the mark of our of a heart that has been found by the grace of God. A heart that have the eagerness and the desire to share the gospel, to share the good news, and to see people coming to Christ and to see people have fruit and people build up in their faith are we the kind of people as Paul is <clears throat> but the law of God the command of God are not burdensome in fact, they are the greatest privilege and delight that we could ever participate in. God has changed our heart in that way. Then let us devote ourselves in ministering to one another, to abandon ourselves and giving ourselves in selfless service and the command of God are not burdensome. We have that kind of attitude. We can have but that kind of heart that Paul has. has. Do we desire to see our brethren, our brothers and sisters in Christ to build up in their faith? Do we have that desire to see them to have the fruit when we meet our brethren and sisters we have the desire to 
test them, to encourage them, and to see them, that they are rather straight. Mother, we thank you, God, for your wonderful message to us, O God. Help us, O Lord, that we may be adept, leaving the under obligation of the goodness that we have received in the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, give us a heart as Paul has to see people's build up in their faith, to see people to have the truths to see people coming to Christ. Lord, we thank you and we pray that make us as what you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.